Well, welcome and thank you for joining us for Art Club today. Thank you to our members and our Visionary Society members for joining us and everyone. I'm Heather Placco, the program manager, and I'm, I'm excited to be hosting artist Jessica Bingham today for the Art Club presentation. This Zoom presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the museum's YouTube account following the presentation. If you do not want your image or video visible, please feel free to stop your view so that you can't be seen. I've muted everyone to begin with and please keep your video muted until the end of the presentation. At the end of the presentation, Jessica invites questions and comments. So please feel free to unmute yourself either temporarily using the space bar on your keyboard or unmute using the bottom at the top. Alternatively, if you do not wish to talk, feel free to ask a question in the comments section and I'll ask the question for you. So without further ado, a big welcome to Jessica Bingham. Hey everybody, thank you for joining me today. I'm, uh, I'm going to be opening up, I'm gonna do a screen share. So you're gonna see my presentation real quick and I hope it goes pretty smoothly here. So thank you again for, for coming, this is exciting. Let's see. Yes. Okay. All right, can everybody see that slide? should say my name if I can get like a like a head nod or something. Okay, thumbs up from Jackie, I see it. Okay, so hi, um, I'm Jessica Bingham. I am an artist, a curator, and a mother. Um, and so today I'm gonna be sharing about my studio practice as well as getting into a little bit about my curatorial practice um, and just the, a lot of ins and outs about my life. Um, let's see, oh, it's a special visitor coming. Okay, so I'm starting with my paintings. I'm, I went all the way back just to my uh, graduate school days because I think that was a really formative time for me. Um, undergraduate was taught me a lot of lessons about the ways that I wanted to begin talking about my work and the, the materials I wanted to start um, exploring and, and, and methods, but it wasn't really until graduate school that I began having a better sense about the content of my work and the purpose of, of why I was making. Um, so in graduate school, I started thinking a, more about um, my travel experiences, finding independence as a young adult, um, and began making work that had more color to it. So my in undergrad, I made a lot of black and white ink paintings, um, but they weren't quite referencing anything of sig significance to me. And so when I started incorporating color into my work, it was a really big shift in the way that I was um, thinking about my practice and talking about the work. Um, and I had a really great professor, Heather Braumeyer, who I think had a talk with us before, so you can find her her um, talk recorded previous to this. And she really informed the way that I was thinking about color and using color um, as a form of exploring memory. And so the ideas that I was thinking about, again, were travel and this independence, but also some of the complexities of being a newlywed at that time. Um, so being connected to somebody in such an important and complex way, um, and also sometimes feeling a disconnect from that person. When you, even though you're in, you're sharing these same spaces, um, so I began thinking about um, also just the playful quality of co using color, and to me, I'm always drawn, in, and this is for my own work, but also for the work and artists that I curate, is I'm usually drawn to pieces and artists who are using color in a really playful way, even though the content may be very heavy, but that is a way to bring somebody in. And so that's something that I think about a lot with my own practice is it's playful, it's colorful, yet the content is, it can be very heavy. So um, as I, a lot of these earlier works, um, they have informed my practice now, but it has changed significantly in that I'm, that I'm now a mother and I'll touch on what that means and how I think about that. So these pieces again were reflecting um, just these changes that I was experiencing in my life and how I was um, evolving as an individual. Th this piece is actually in Bradley University right now. So I went to uh, Bradley University for undergrad or for graduate school, sorry. Um, and some of these works no longer exist and they have become pieces 
of newer work. So I often think about ephemerality in my work. And it's interesting to me to think about ephemerality in the sense of a painting, where we think of painting as something that will exist forever. It has to be this archival object. Um, and I, I enjoy the process of becoming very physical with the painting. So oftentimes my works are unstretched. I paint them on the floor or on the wall. I step on them and it's not out of like a disrespect for the, the, the painting, but it's a way for me to feel physically connected to it. And I think that has informed um, the way I've, oh, it, it's always been a part of my practice is being actually like very um, connected to it, not just on something that sits on an easel, but something that I can walk on, something that I can tear. Um, so a lot of these works no longer exist because they have been made into newer pieces. So there's also this aspect of ephemerality in the sense that these paintings, um, they had their time and now they're made into something new that, that, that I can carry with as my life continues to evolve. So I was also at this time just thinking about um, making paintings that come off the wall, um, off of the stretcher. They're very billowed um, forms that needed a lot of lifting and maneuvering to get to be um, what you see here as in something that comes out um, that a viewer needs to walk around um, and be aware of in the space instead of a painting that's on the wall. So these pieces are, some, this one was actually very stiff and it was, it was standing. Um, so again, thinking about installation, color, irregular shapes. Um, and then I had a major shift in my life. So these, all of those works were about 2014. Um, and then I lost a really close friend of mine. Um, so I will talk about this work in a very sympathetic um, way. Uh, so this was 2015 and I lost um, a dear friend, childhood friend, and began really thinking about my, my own capacity for love and loss. And a lot of those memories from, from my childhood and growing up in this really beautiful neighborhood surrounded by all these kids um, and how we would explore the world together. And one thing that was really unique to my childhood experience um, and the kids that I shared that with was that we grew up across the street from a cemetery, which as a kid is a really strange thing because you're then confronted with your own mortality at a very young age. And so thinking about losing a friend, experiencing the loss of a friend in early adulthood, um, being flooded with these emotions and wanting to preserve them and wanting to preserve that person because you loved them so dearly. But then also recognizing that a lot of the emotions and experiences that I was feeling were my own. and the best way for me to grieve through that was to make this work. So this friend, and I'm just going to call them my friend, um, was a very colorful, uh, eclectic, eclectic person. Um, and so at the their funeral, we were asked, everybody was asked to wear tie-dye shirts. And so I collected these tie-dye shirts for my MFA exhibition from my family. Um, and I wrapped them up as a way to remember that, that emotion. Um, I was also thinking about childhood in the sense of exploring the woods, um, which is what we often call, called the, just like a few trees that were in front of the cemetery was exploring the woods. Um, and so we had, I, I was really curious about bringing in the natural and found objects together to make these dialogues about these really playful, balloons or colors that you would that kids are often drawn to but then there's that natural aspect that really roots you down into the earth. I was also thinking about birthday parties, slumber parties, making tents, um, pretending, just this idea of using how these materials can help um, bring those ideas to life. And so one thing that I so I, this is a tent and, and I just really I just really love this image actually, but this is the full tent. So this tent was actually part of my MFA exhibition um, and it had grass inside of it. This is something that I do often. And like I mentioned with my paintings is that I reuse them. So I'm also reusing a lot of these objects. So after this, um, my friend passed, I you'll see that there's a big transition from making paintings into making objects. So although I was studying painting and really thinking about painting, I felt like I needed a physical 
object um, to hold, to collect, to think about, to walk around as if I was reliving a lot of these experiences. So that's why there's such a big shift from the paintings into these assemblages and installations. So when this piece was in my MFA exhibition, I said there was, there was this grass that was underneath. Um, one thing that is really special to this whole um, experience of grief for me is that into our 20s, we were able to share a summer together before, um, before he ended up passing away. And during that summer, we worked for my dad's tree and lawn business. So we were mowing grass all the time. Every single day we were out mowing lawns together. And so that was another way to root back into this natural, to the natural landscape. So the grass was in the tent and had this aroma, of course, I would go and water it every day, um, but it had that aroma of like a freshly cut grass, but also with the sheets around it. So thinking about that comfort of being within like um, a, just a child's tent, maybe made with their parents' bed sheets or something like that. So it also was, it just was this experience of being able to walk into that. So as I transitioned um, into, this is a separate exhibition using the same tent, um, I was thinking about this idea of visiting cemeteries, visiting places. My friend was was not physically buried, so um, visiting cemeteries as a way of grieving, documenting, processing, having a place to go that I could think about them. Um, so I began collecting dirt. So you'll see dirt show up a lot in this work too. So this dirt that rests on a pillow within this um, this tent is actually dirt that I collected from that neighborhood from our my house as a kid, from their house as a kid, and from the cemetery, and I combined it all. And then inside, resting inside, buried in these in this pile of dirt, is all of these recreated notes that I've kept from from our youth. Um, so they were like on, like in a diary, and I I recreated them on this on this the same paper, um, but preserved the originals. And this was just an idea of like somebody could go up and take those and read those, but how precious they are to me and that I needed to keep them in this, this safe spot. Um, again, you'll see the shirts. I use those tie-dye shirts um, as a way of thinking about how, this was across from that tent. So thinking about how children oftentimes will think of these escape routes um, if they feel endangered or if they're just, I don't know, like me, I was always thinking about, well, what's the best way that I could get out of this room if I, and I need to save my, my, my sisters. Um, so putting this just slightly outside of the window as an, as an ode to that, that very playful, but kind of dramatic childhood brain. Um, began incorporating flowers into my work too. So this was a piece that I collected all of the dandelions in, um, in this field in Peoria. And I just sat there and I had a friend, um, Alexander Martin, and I, I, who's a collaborator of mine too, but document this process. And then I put them all into this basket. So dandelions, of course, have this significant to childhood as this magical flower that often is the first flower a child will give to their parent um, as a shine, sign of love. But also yellow is um, within flowers is a form of friendship. It's a color of friendship. Um, so in that same time period, I recreated this entire, um, this, my, I had a neighbor who was ripping up their, their lawn. Um, so I asked if I could have all of that grass. Again, there's that significance to the land, but also to the grass and being able to mow the grass and then to the cemetery, almost as a, as a playground in some ways. So I built this one, I installed all the grass and the dirt in the garage and put a little pathway up so and then built this tombstone the tombstone is made from uh, rose petals with wax and it was meant to be that you are grieving somebody or something but you can't quite get to them that you have to grieve from a distance and how painful that can be because you want to be right there but it's just you just can't so i had asked everybody who came to see this exhibition that they would just honor that honor the the distance of not being able to see them fully um, from that, the, again, this idea of ephemerality, I wanted to, I knew that that piece, this piece wasn't going to last. I knew all the dirt was going to die, even if I had tried to water it. Um, but what I did do was start to collect all of that dirt and reuse it into other works. 
So I made several of these different dirt piles. Um, again, this is referencing the earth, but it's also um, referencing a very specific moment from my childhood where we had this dirt pile at my friend's house that we would climb on and dig in and play in. Um, so I had all these different different ways of making this. Sometimes there were four of them together. Sometimes there was a single large heap. And then I started adding these flowers to it. So uh, kind of referencing this 90s kids, like very colorful, prismatic, um, Lisa Frank-esque flowers. And then I'm moving back into painting because I was fortunate. I had a 2017 um, summer residency at the Prairie Center of the Arts where I asked um, and my, my proposal was to just focus on painting again because I felt like I'd removed myself, but I found ways that I was connecting those mounds, the motif of a, of a tombstone, and the, and the simple flower shapes into my paintings again. Very playful, very colorful, but again, relating to this idea that there is loss and there's beauty and there's death and there's decay, but how can we find the joy in that and how can I bring people in to be curious about it, to, to learn about you know, how does one go about grieving in a positive and um, productive uh, way? And again, this is just my own experience, but it was a very helpful process and still is. So these pieces um, are referencing the various cemeteries that I went to. I, I can't even tell you how many cemeteries I've been to in my life, um, but I did have extensive photo documentation that I would reference. Um, and some of them have these really unique shapes. So there's actually like, these are supposed to be tombstones here, um, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen like family plots where the, they all are in a circle and they're, they're, keep, they're holding, basically holding each other together. So this is the culmination of that residency was to have a, an exhibition down at Mantle Art Space in San Antonio. And so I was able to show um, all the paintings that I had made, as well as two, this this wreath, this funeral funeral wreath, um, again with the dirt that was collected from that that uh, cemetery installation in the garage, and then also this floor piece, which is um, I don't remember how many mounds are here, but there are over 50 um, piles that were collected from various cemeteries that I had visited to. I often take the dirt from underneath a tree because there's not a significance there to somebody's grave. Um, and also just that the tree is getting this life from all of these people that it's being surrounded from. So I'm trying to find the, the small, really beautiful poetic ways to look at this as something that other people may find quite morbid. Um, but the way that the uh, the piles were placed out was that it was laid in a standard burial plot, the width, length and width of that. And then the paintings were surrounding it. So I thought that that was a nice way to connect this very colorful and prismatic um, paintings with some of these natural elements that that I think really uh, bonded and, and preserved the way that I was um, thinking about my friend. And then shortly after that, I had an exhibition where, again, I'm reusing the dirt. This is supposed to be um, resemble a plot of somebody um, recently buried. And um, surrounding that was all of these yellow roses. And again, that significance of the color of yellow referencing friendship and a sign of caring. And what I was asking was every viewer who came in that they would walk around, really feel and mourn this, um, have this, this feeling of mourning, but then to take one of those yellow roses and place them um, on the dirt as a way to honor somebody that they had lost or honors um, an idea of themselves that is no longer. So mourning is in so many, grieving and mourning are in so many different ways of our life. Um, it's not just through the passing of somebody that we care about, um, but also just the idea of losing who we thought we would be, a pet. Um, so I was pretty happy with the way that th this turned out because I think a lot of people responded to it in a positive way um, instead of taking it always in such a quite, in, in, in a literal way. 
Um, but at this time, I was also pregnant. So this was 2017, moving into 2018. And I had to, to shift my approach in some ways because I was experiencing this process of, of bringing new life into the world. And so how does, how does, how I was navigating this idea of grieving while also celebrating new life. So this is the first piece that I made postpartum. Um, it is this fabric that uh, was gifted to me as well as a piece of wood that was taken from our house at that time. So I was thinking about these similar, um, smaller ways that I could still be making work while experiencing all the newness of parenthood. And relating it very closely to our home um, and, and still in grieving maybe who like a, a, a person was before they had a child and, and just this really feeling um, connected to a home and to a space because of that. So these were, these are segments from our house, from our floor. Um, we had some work done on our floors before we, we moved from that house, but I have taken those with me because I think it's important to stay connected to the places that we've been. And that in and of itself is, is a way to grieve and remember and process. And then a little bit after that, I was preparing um, a similar exhibition to the roses uh, that were before. So you can see the roses are reused and I use those I've used those roses now in four exhibitions. Um, I think it's important to reuse materials as much as possible. And so these, these pieces, the roses are all dried. They were cut um, to different lengths because I needed, I was asking then viewers to, to build this, um, this wreath together. It could be seen as a funeral wreath. It could be seen as um, a wreath that once hangs on their house. Um, but I, also, I'm just thinking about flowers in the sense that when somebody passes, we often give them flowers um, to help with that, that process and healing. Um, yet those flowers will die and we put fake flowers on people's tombstones and those will be around forever. So I'm thinking about that duality of the man-made versus um, natural as well. So this is just an image of, of some of that building together. And, and people were really um, contemplative and they were considering where they were going to put their flower. I had one um, gentleman tell me that it was a really healing process for him because he had just lost his son. Um, so just being able to connect with the work in a meaningful way um, and then share in those experiences and stories too. This installation was actually at Heartbreaker in Peoria. Um, so, and it's, it's was a pretty complicated, uh, it looks very simple, but it was a very complicated process and, and thinking for me. So I, this is an actual tombstone that's laying on the ground here filled with the yellow roses. Um, found that tombstone at an estate sale um, and it references flowers uh, in the text. So that was a really beautiful thing um, to find. And then this piece was taken from a neighbor um, from their garbage, uh, so that reuse, thinking about neighborhoods and, and sharing materials. But this large scale drawing here, um, so my friends did have like a college course um, where they were, it was a college art course that they were in. And a few years after he passed, his parents gave me all of his drawing materials, which was one of the most beautiful and significant gifts that I've ever received. And I recreated, he was not a great drawer at all, but I recreated um, this drawing that was in the sketchbook because it was related to home. I was thinking about our neighborhoods, our neighborhood and growing up next to each other. And I recreated um, this massive graphite drawing with the materials that his par parents gave to me. Um, it, the drawing exists in my house. It's, it's not that large, but this was painted over since. So it was, again, just quite ephemeral, thinking about um, how quick our, our life can pass if we're not paying attention. And then this hung on the opposite wall. It was just a single, uh, one of those Adirondack chairs. Um, but behind it, and I used that chair because, and chairs have shown up in my work um, before, but I used that chair as, this, as I like the way that it looks. It resembles a tombstone but also that this chair can also represents the absence of a person. Um, behind it 
resting right behind these boards here is one of the first gifts that my friend uh, gave to me when we were a kid. Um, and so it's got like a little kitten on it with a cardinal and it has some text above it. But um, so just thinking about those small exchanges between children that we often don't see, but are so if you catch them and you and you're paying attention, how beautiful those little things are. And then the roses again, you're probably thinking <laughs> these are, I've overkilled these roses. Um, this was a wreath, a large scale wreath that I made as part of Terrain Biannual, um, curated by Alexander Martin in front of this blue house. Um, blue house is significant because I grew up in a blue house. Um, and so the wreath again has these yellow roses. Um, they were put on with, with really thin wire um, and then sprayed with like a sealant because it was supposed to be out in the weather for 24 seven. Um, at this time, uh, and I guess still now, but Alex and I were both experiencing and sharing grief stories. So it felt very um, significant to be talking about that with somebody so close to me and in this way that they could understand my, my curatorial practice, but also my art practice in a way that some other people will never have the chance to do. And so that was from 2019. There was an exhibition in between there, but all that work is since gone because I've cut it up and reused it. Um, but this is now moving into 2020, um, thinking about, you know, obviously we're all stuck at home in COVID and um, the significance of this time and being able to really settle into this new home um, that we had just moved into. And so I was thinking about the garden that we were making in the backyard and, and lockdown and just being very present with my daughter. So the two of us made this, um, these window uh, paintings for our neighborhood. And again, they, they no, longer, no longer exist. And now I'm gonna move into some of my newer paintings because all of that work has informed the, the pieces that I'm making now um, in, in many different ways. But these, these paintings are again, based off of our garden and our home and our sunsets, the, the sunsets um, that we're able to, that I'm able to see almost every morning because I wake up so early. But I'm still finding these connections to our home and, and considering ways that, um, that the grieving process and being able to experience that is then informing the way that I, that I approach life now. And so I think they're quite, beautiful abstracted paintings. They're referencing our garden, um, really thinking about the growth of things coming from areas of sadness. And so a lot of these pieces, they actually have wildflowers that have been cut from our garden. Um, again, relating these this really colorful and abstract paintings, but connecting it back to nature as a way to process and heal. Um, I'm also was thinking just about the, the, the subtle changes of time and as everybody was at home during this period and still, um, but having a garden, being able to watch time happen in real life as something that you don't normally have the opportunity to just sit and enjoy. So yeah, these flowers were all cut and, and used in our house. Um, around the house and then, but their main purpose of growing them was to then be incorporated into, into these paintings. So all of these works that I'm gonna be showing now are the previous paintings that I had showed earlier in this presentation. So I've since then, probably 90% of the paintings that I made from graduate school, they no longer exist and they, they now are within these paintings. Um, some other things that I've been thinking about are, especially as we're dealing with COVID, is that the, the 1940s World War II Victory Gardens as a form of um, connection between community, um, resilience and reliance on the land and how a lot of people started having gardens during COVID, COVID gardens. Um, and again, it's that resourcefulness and connection even when we can't be with each other. So these are just some detail shots from those. Um, those wildflowers being sewn back into the works. And I'm often thinking about in, in a lot of this newer work is even though they're, they're older pieces and they're being brought in to make newer work, I'm not necessarily thinking about mending, but more of an unmending 
of relationships, of time, of um, repairing these paintings to become something new and, and beautiful and exciting for myself. Um, and a lot of these sections are, they're, they're from my previous paintings, but they're also from collaborations with other people. So this section right here, for example, is from a large scale collaboration with Backspace Collective, which is no longer, but um, had a couple of friends who worked on this, this massive painting together. And then um, we each got a portion of it in the end. So then oh, this, this piece, I recently changed this piece. It didn't have any of this like mauve color on top of it, but I, I wanted to really start thinking more about the process of gardening and the idea of covering up so that new growth can come. And there's more of the, the wildflowers, something that I, that I think is really beautiful happening in this work is that these previous graphite marks are then mimicking the flow of the flower stems, especially down here. So I thought that was a really beautiful thing that, that I wasn't planning, but you know, those little moments happen and you're like, oh, good. And then just sowing, sowing of seeds and letting things be, be fresh and new again. And the last bit of this is talking very briefly about my curatorial practice. Um, so I really started to consider myself as a curator in um, 2015 when started Project 1612 with Alexander Martin and my husband, Zach Ott. Um, so we co-founded this together and it was in this garage. It's an, uh, two, it was a two-car garage. It was beautiful inside. Um, I really miss it because we since moved to Morton just because I commute to Bloomington every day. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on our community engagement, area artists, and just bringing a couple artists in from outside of the area that really focused on community. And so this is one of, um, this is a show that was a collaboration between Bradley University undergraduate students during their spring break. It was called Shrine. Um, this work actually back here is one of the first um, video pieces that Allison Walsh had made, who's now uh, a documentary film artist that I think we're all pretty familiar with in our area. Um, this work from October 2016 called Discount Dreams um, by the Bradley University resident artist Sophie Ansel. Um, was, Project 1612 was very connected to Bradley University. I'm really proud of that too because I was an alum and I was also teaching there for a period of time. Um, but the support from the faculty members and the staff was phenomenal um, and allowed a lot of 1612 to grow from that. We also started a, this is Alex, my daughter <laughs> Finley, um, my husband Zach Ott, Dylan Peschke and Haley Funk. So in 2016, we started an internship program and through Bradley, um, uh, Anna Frederick was our first intern who actually designed our logo. And then uh, Hannah, or Haley, excuse me, and Dylan were with us for about three years. So they got to work on a number of projects with us. Um, this was the Gettys collection, Brandon and Abby Gettys, um, who used to be uh, Peoria residents and collected art from many area artists. So we got to put all of that on display, which was really exciting. And then also working with Joe Zich of 309 Cultures. Uh, he made a meal and dessert in response to an artwork, or to the artworks and artists that were on display during this time. And then this 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 exhibition, although Eric was, it's Eric Anthony Burtis and not a Peoria resident, but just a, a, a really good friend of mine. Now, since this exhibition, we've developed a really strong connection. Um, so they were focused on performance art, LGBTQ education and history, creating accepting spaces and then learning and sharing pronouns was a, is a big part of his practice. Um, so this is Eric right here. So he invited everybody to do a hobby horse race together. And it was not a race in the sense that you're trying to win and you're trying to be better than, you know, the next person, but in a way that we're in was encouraging everybody to just be their funky weird self. So Eric, of course, is in whitey tidies. Um, everybody had a hobby horse and then you were supposed to name your hobby horse and share your pronouns. Um, so she, her, he, him, they, them. And then you were to race. This is actually me and 
my little baby Finley. Um, so we race down and, and, and back and then you just cheer and be really excited. But that relationship has, has really grown and I'm excited. I'll share in a little bit about um, Eric had a show at ISU. So um, as we moved from our project 1612 house, we also began considering different ways to explore um, Alex and I's curatorial practice together. So we did terrain biannual for a second time um, where this, it was now at Alex's house. Um, so we just were thinking about what is a change of location? What does that mean to the development of 1612? And how can we be more open to ideas and ways of supporting our community? So this exhibition um, featured four artists. And this piece right here that's actually taking place was a performance by um, Jam, uh, was Jam level then, but of uh, Black Dog Metal Arts. And breaking down the barriers and deconstruction, deconstruction of hierarchy and encouraging strangers to play with one another and be really open and, and, and laughing. So what was happening um, is Jam had hidden plastic eggs or little eggs around the yard filled with confetti and everybody was meant to grab one and smash it on a stranger's head. And then it, it just was this laughter and excitement of, of running and being very childlike together. This is John Steck Jr. who was the boxes in the front yard here. Their um, photo uh, light sensitive paper placed in these handmade boxes and then on top of them is this organic flowers and material. I think they did collect some of it from Alex's yard. And then in the end, um, the photo was just the imprint of what was left. This is Venice Keys. So she had work in the windows. Um, this was to engage people in thinking about empath empathy and open-mindedness mm -hmm. and celebrations of all forms, especially di the divineness of the female body. And then Sage Dawson. Um, so this piece is in a very tiny um, miniature version of the garage of 1612. And it is patterning um, from historic Florentine and Venetian art and architecture um, as, a, as documented while she was working in, and studying in, in, in Italy. And then um, 1612 has also done a number of um, studio visits Pre-COVID, we would go and actually visit with the artists in their studio, document this process. I find that a lot of people don't, um, don't have proper documentation of themselves within their studio and how valuable that is um, as a form of remembering, but also just understanding what the artistic process is like. I think seeing an artist's studio or their home is, um, that's always a really special and meaningful process for me and experience for me. So this, this one is of Jackie Music um, when she was in the Sunbeam building with little Ellie right there. Um, this, st this shot is of Pat Keck. Um, she is a sculptor in the area, but also was working on a number of drawings. And I just thought this was a really beautiful image of her. And then as we transitioned into COVID, um, I didn't want to put that, um, it's on pause at the moment, but at the beginning of COVID, I didn't want to put that, this uh, project, um, on the back burner. And so we opened it up into, to anybody um, who had wanted to submit and it became a little bit shorter. So in the previous ones, we would sit, we'd have a conversation and then later we would um, email the artists with a list of questions and put out this published interview. Um, as things changed and as life became more complicated with working at home full-time, um, we did a simpler method where the artists would send images of their studio, their um, any social media handles, um, their website, and, and any images of their artwork that they wanted, wanted to include. So this is, this was Anthony Hamilton, um, an ISU alum, uh, living and working in Chicago currently, but they didn't, they weren't able to have their MFA exhibition because of timing of all of this. So, um, or they weren't able to have it during the time that it was meant to be. So we were able to, to, to give them this platform to share this work that they'd been working on. And then this past fall, we organized um, a yard sale in which we collected artwork from friends and previous 1612 artists and um, donated all of the funds to Peoria Guild of Black Artists and Girls Light Our Way. 
So it was a pretty incredible experience because it was pay what you can. So if somebody wanted, they could only afford a dollar for an artwork, then that was that was totally acceptable. There was no um, high or low. And so I, I think we were able to raise a significant amount of money to donate to these organizations. Um, and we're still figuring out ways that we can maybe begin to incorporate this into an annual event. So I'm gonna shift gears for the last portion of this because I'm also a curator at University Galleries of Illinois State University. And a lot of the work that I'm gonna show you, um, I, I've only, because of COVID, had the opportunity to curate uh, two exhibitions working on two currently. Um, but these two shows, you'll see some parallels maybe to the way that I think about work in the sense that I think, like I really enjoy playful work. I like these complicated, um, issues being brought in a lighter manner so that the viewer can come in and, and really dissect it in a way that that works for them. Um, so Katie, this is an installation by Katie Bell. It's very playful. It's a it was a dynamic installation. She was responding to our space in a number of ways. Um, she's a site specific installation artist, but has a background in painting. So painting the painting language is very important to the way that she makes marks and thinks about color and form. Um, so she was responding to like this wedge shape of our gallery um, and informed by her childhood home. Uh, she lived in and grew up in a Victorian home that her parents were constantly, uh, there, she said it was a constant construction site. So thinking about rooms, um, things being out of place. But one thing that I think is really interesting about Katie's work is that she usually makes the installations with objects that she finds within the, the town or the city that she's in. So a lot of these materials were collected in Bloomington Normal. And it is very theatrical. Um, we have a, a number of uh, tour exhibition tours for children. And one thing that really stood out to me was that she was saying that she hopes that it almost feels like all of these pieces are just like holding their breath and that at any moment they could just burst into like movement and dance. And so I thought that was something really fun to share with kids. And then back to Eric's work. So Eric Anthony Burtis, um, again, that connection that I made with him was, uh, it's invaluable. And so we grew our relationship from 1612 exhibition and I invited him to have an exhibition at, at University Galleries um, where we were able to expand on a number of those ideas that he was um, thinking about with the 1612 show. So I think in total, Eric had three or four performances that he did during this exhibition. It was again, very closely related to LGBTQ history, um, historical struggle, struggles of the LGBTQ community and encouraging allyship. So we hosted a panel discussion um, talking about the importance of pronoun sharing and creating welcoming spaces for LGBTQ students and community. Um, and then just really elaborated on LGBTQ history throughout the entire exhibition. So these pieces, there were these, um, these three series of quilts. So these are actually, he calls them the twins. He is, he's a twin himself, um, but they're all referencing in some way or another, the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt from uh, the first rendition of that was November, 1985. And then also closely aligning with um, the, the exhibition itself, the dates were closely aligning with the anniversary of Matthew Shepard's uh, death and also the 2018 memorial um, to the that a memorial to him in the Washington National Cathedral. Um, so he was thinking about the uh, identities of the ghosts of queer history, um, many queer artists throughout history. So David Wonrovich, Keith Haring, um, Felice Gonzalez Torres, and and what their um, their legacy, what legacies they've left behind. And these are some images. This was again, the hobby horse race. We walked across um, campus in all of these costumes. It was near Halloween time. So that was a really playful way to, to approach it. Um, and then it had a hobby horse race in the quad. And then this is another, this was the last performance. So this is Eric in the front with a number of friends and, and colleagues. Um, this piece was titled Don't Forget You're a Sunflower, and it was informed by Allen Ginsberg's poem, The Sunflower Sutra. Um, so this is a performance at the beginning where uh, Eric put out this, this oval shape of all these sunflowers um, and then stripped down to their tidy whities put on a business suit, and um, 
was then walking around introducing themselves in like a very like formal way saying, hi, my name is Eric Anthony Burtis. My pronouns are he, him. What are your pro pronouns? What is your name? And so just like opening that conversation up and making it feel, um, making it normal, normalizing this experience. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, but I'm really excited to hear any questions or comments you have. And thank you for joining me. This is this has been nice. Well, thank you very much, Jessica, for that wonderful presentation. And I invite anyone that wishes to um, ask a question to Jessica to go ahead and unmute yourself now. Or once again, you can go ahead and type a question in the chat and I'm happy to ask for you. Heather, would you like me to stop? Um, yeah, go you? ahead and then okay. we can see each other a little bigger. That's good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jess. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and get started here with a question. Jessica, I wonder with your process of these pieces being very fluid and you know you tear them apart and remake them and reuse a lot of things, how do you decide when a piece is complete? Um, I think the having a piece be complete, I think is also determined by what my life looks at that time. So a piece may have been complete um, and then moving forward in life no longer feels that way. So I think that I try to look at it as each painting um, that I make serves a purpose in that time, but allowing it to change is part of the process. So I guess, let's say Barbie Perry, for example, has one of those paintings in the slideshow, and that will always be complete because the purpose was for it to be part of her her life. Um, and I that's not something that I can, it's not mine anymore. Um, in that in that way of like ownership of something. But I think it is just a matter of it serves its purpose. And then once that purpose is, it's not there anymore, then maybe it can be made into something new. Right. Has there ever been a piece that you haven't reused or felt that you would never want to reuse in a moment from Holly? Yes. Um, I have two paintings that are about my nephew's birth and neither of those will ever be touched. Those, those uh, one hangs in his house, um, he's six, and one I still have in my basement <laughs> that eventually will go and hang with the other one. So no, those ones will never be, be changed. That's a good question. I have another question. A lot of your pieces seem to tell a personal story and experience. Do you ever add any written word to your pieces? Mm. I haven't ever added text to any of the works themselves, but I do write extensively. Um, mm. And I think part of just the writing helps me navigate some of those thoughts. Um, but I haven't really included any text into the actual word. I tried that in graduate school, but I didn't, I felt too, um, it felt too distant from me because it wasn't something that I was, um, I guess it just didn't feel like a natural process because I think the work is so, because it is so narrative and it is um, so personal that I don't, I like sharing it in this format, but I think writing it and having it um, physically connected to the, to the paintings um, is a whole other thing that I have yet or maybe never will explore, I'm not quite sure. Anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask Jessica? Go ahead, Jackie. Um, I, hi, friend. <laughs> um, you talked about um, positive grieving or grieving in a productive, positive way. And I'm just curious, um, right now we're going through something with COVID this whole year, um, a collective kind of grieving of what life used to be and what life will be going forward, which very much relates to your work, I see. Um, how, do you, how do you see yourself going forward? Do you feel like you'll have more opportunities to um, 
sorry, I'm trying to formulate my question, but I'm a talker. Um, do you think that you will find ways to invite the community to grieve um, collectively together, like a, a mourning process for this whole time? Or yeah. uh, has your work shifted more towards like personal? Well, I think it always will be. I don't know always, but right now it is very personal, but I think making the work about the gardens, because a lot of people who I, who I know, um, whether they were a gardener before COVID or they're a gardener just because of COVID, and that's where I was coming from. I've never had a garden before. Um, I grew up with my, my mom and dad always had gardens, but it wasn't something that I was involved with because something that they were doing, I was a teenager. So there's that, but I think for, so that was like making the garden was a process of grieving. Um, and it was nice to be able to share uh, either like tips or pictures with other people as they're also experiencing this collective grieving um, and finding the calm within the, the garden. Um, I have in the past done, uh, it was called grieving stories where um, it was like a call for people if they wanted to share their grieving story that they could send in a document, um, like their own story of, uh, and I got several of them where somebody was grieving um, the person who they thought they would be, somebody was grieving their mother that they had lost in childhood, um, somebody was grieving a pet, and so these were written stories that um, that people would send to me, and I thought that was a really, it was interesting to be the person receiving that because that's a lot to hold. Um, but I was also asking for those stories to help me better understand grief. Um, so I think that there are ways that I've explored it in welcoming other people. Um, but it, grief is a hard thing for people to talk about, even, even if it is something that you think about all the time or make work about, it doesn't, it, it's not that it gets easier. It just becomes a way to um, to put that that energy that build up in that that um, sadness into something that is not that the work has to be beautiful but to me something making something from that does help so I don't know I don't know we're experiencing a, a loss in my family right now so we'll see um, how these conversations um, I guess if, if they impact how I approach different things or if I, if it's not something that I want to want to get into, or um, I think it depends on what it is to what it is you're grieving and how, and how, how you knew that person or that idea of yourself. So I think there's a number of variables. We'll see. Any other question? Go ahead, Peggy. Hi. Hi, Jess. Hi. You spoke actually on two language issues, the language of flowers and the language of color. And I'd like you to expand a little bit more on how you use color and your color choices and your intentionality mm -hmm. um, towards communicating and, um, this emotion and this memory. So I know you, you kind of navigate to a, a what I see is a very identifiable palette for you. Can you explain what some of the, the attraction for some of those colors are? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I think that my color choices, cause I usually, I'm a very like neutral person. That's what I like to put on and wear in the world. But when I'm thinking about my paintings, um, I'm often thinking about the colors that I remember from my childhood, which was very prismatic um, I had a bright purple room. Um, my parents really let me explore with color as a kid, um, always changing things up. But Lisa Frank had a really big, big impact on my visual aesthetics. And so thinking about those really prismatic colors, um, like hot pinks and lime greens and vivid purples and bringing those in. I think that I've muted my colors a little bit because I was also thinking, um, keeping all of that in mind, but also as we're shifting into, or what was shifting and thinking about being in COVID, it's, it's everybody's feeling the heaviness of this and the weight of this. I'm still calling it this year because it is. 
um, we're still within the one year of, of dealing with this together. So I didn't want everything to be so bright because also the, the brightness of a lot of those colors from my past paintings was also thinking about that childhood with my friend and, and that, that relationship. But I think I'm expanding um, my color choices based on um, this collective morning, but still attempting. And it seems like a lot of people who I know are still attempting to find these these elements of joy um, throughout all this. So, and then uh, one thing that I they think I'm pretty that that I do often is if I'm using a color, um, and this is just a technical way of approaching how I paint. But um, if I'm using a color, I will then take and, and it's nearly done, or I want to mix. It, add another color. I'll, I'll usually take a portion of that of one color and add it to another so that there's almost this um, like, yes, they're mixed together, but there's also that that bonding between the two colors, even if it's making something new. I don't know if that makes any sense. But for painters or printmakers, when you're, you know, mixing and trying to keep something that looks consistent, it's for me, it's oftentimes just blending those colors together to make something new. Like a transition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hi. Thanks for joining. I have to say something. Uh, it's more of a comment. Like in my mind, the way you were talking about your work, the way your work is like mixing with your life, just remind me of textile, how women during the history like have textile just along with life and all the time they're doing something like a cre creativity you can put down and take up all the time with your life the way you're talking about your work just remind me of them of that kind of approach I don't know mm. if that makes sense. yeah i mean the especially the paintings that were um more, more like those billowing forms. They did They did have like, I mean, obviously it's on canvas, so it's fabric, but we don't usually wear canvas. But the idea that they're they're moving and they, they're they a little bit more fluid as, as in like a fabric or a blanket, um, I definitely have thought about that. And being able to almost like wrap yourself up, up in them. Um, I don't think I've ever done that, but um, I have made some collaborations with with one of my sisters where reusing old materials to make clothing from those and that that was an interesting way to explore the use of like the phys the physical fabric of a painting yeah thank you for that thank you someone would like to know uh, do you paint in oil watercolor or gouache i actually use acrylic acrylic um yeah which i'm not the hugest fan because it's plastic, but oil painting dries. I, I'm not patient enough for oil painting. Um, I do use watercolor and gouache if I'm making works on paper, but I, I think that for now, the, the acrylic has just served. I, I also like the transparency of it because I don't, I don't gesso or um, I don't gesso any of my canvases they're all just raw canvas and I like the way that it soaks through um, I especially think of like Helen Frankenthaler's work um, or the Washington Color School um, painters and just how that the fluidity of the paint is so much more and being able to stain um, and then too with thinking about tie-dye and the references with my friend and that that significance of that um, that dyeing method to them so there is a, there is a connection between being able to stain a canvas and how that relates back to dyeing of fabric. And there was a question about what's the plan moving forward for Project 1612 since you moved? I wish I knew. Um, we had plans to make a new 1612, um, keeping the name. Uh, I have a lot of, Alex and I have a lot of talking that we need to do because we it's it's been will it be another physical space will we continue like a residency program even after covid like how safe is it to have all these different people in your house um some of you are familiar with project 1612 but it was also a short-term residency program where where artists were able to stay with us and it was a really intimate experience um 
And now we're we're really, I think, changing, not changing, but trying to put more of our emphasis on community engagement and the yard sale and doing the digital studio visits or or when we can physical studio visits. It's it's such a good way to get to know people and to share about their work, um, but raise awareness for different things happening in, in Peoria and beyond. So we'll see. I'm interested to know how it's going to change too. <laughs> well, good luck with that. We have um, one final question from the comments and then if anyone has last questions from here, we can go ahead and ask those as well. Um, you speak about grieving regarding people, but I wonder about grieving childhood ideas and beliefs. Do you see this as already existing in your work? Yes. Um, I think part of the the make the the making the objects and the installations and even some of the paintings after my friend passed was um, a way of per like I felt like I needed to preserve who I was along with preserving who they were because it felt like if I didn't do something in response that everything was going to fall apart and it already had fallen apart. So it was so it was yeah it was a grieving of like of child of childhood but also that like pureness that children can have and then when you experience a grief like that it's it's can it feels like it's stripping that away and so yeah i think i think it was and this was all during my graduate studies too so um and there was no other way for me to really work through it i think that that was a good um that was just the the right way for me so yeah thank you yeah does anyone have any final questions for jessica Okay, well, we will go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you everyone for thank attending you. Art Club today. And a huge thank, thank you, you to Jessica Bingham for presenting her amazing work to us. And be sure to tune in next month, Tuesday, February 9th at 1 p.m. And we'll meet you right back here. And we will be hosting Chelsea Tams for a special presentation of their work. And a big thank you also to museum members and Visionary Society members for their continued support in making our virtual programming possible. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, Mom. <laughs>